En primer lugar, bienvenidos todos. Este es un evento que estamos organizando desde la Comisión de Perforación del IAPG. Eh, hemos visto la necesidad de, que tenemos de abordar estos temas, eh, la automatización en los equipos de perforación o en el, la perforación en general, pero no solo la automatización como la entendemos de una, una expresión mecánica de que un proceso pasa en lugar de ser manual a automático, sino la automatización de todos los procesos, incluyendo la inteligencia artificial y lo que llamamos en inglés el machine learning, o el, el, el aprendizaje de las máquinas, ¿cierto? Eh, creemos que eh, hace muchos años, o quizás desde el principio, hemos tenido grados superiores eh, eh, que han ido incrementándose de automatización de nuestros procesos antes manuales. Cualquiera que haya estado hace 20 años en un taladro, ver un Iron Roughneck era una cosa excepcional. Hoy creo que no ver un Iron Roughneck sería excepcional. O sea, hoy la automatización de, de la, del ajuste de, de, de las tuberías ¿no? es absolutamente normal, pero hace 20 años no lo era. Y, y así con un montón de cosas, la subida de de elementos de todos los elementos del proceso de visaje de, de cualquier herramienta, incluyendo los, los, los casing, todo lo hemos visto eh, mejorar con los automatismos. Pero vamos a un paso más, porque estamos buscando ahora que la, la, los procesos no solo sean, eh, pasen de ser con el uso de cierta fuerza a ser algo automático, comandado por, por eh, una computadora, un joystick sino también que eh, el proceso de toma de decisión sea eh, llevado a cabo por un sistema inteligente, un sistema al cual se ha programado para evaluar situaciones y para eh, procesar información y tomar decisiones. A veces en forma de eh, sugerencia o a veces directamente la decisión se pasa a la acción en forma automática. El, decíamos recién hace un rato que por un ejemplo que yo estoy, estuve viendo recientemente eh, la, la, la perforación direccional algo que maneja muy bien nuestro mi, mi compañero aquí Eduardo pero que él me ha enseñado lo suficiente para decir lo que voy a decir así que eh, la perforación direccional antes era algo bastante manual empezó a ser cada vez más automatizada contamos hoy con herramientas que le llamamos Rotary Steerable Tools, o sea que sabemos que rotando ellas solas van a ir corrigiendo la, la trayectoria, sensan la trayectoria, son capaces de mantener un pozo en la verticalidad o de mantenerlo en una dirección programada. Podemos además bajarles comandos para que corrijan esa, esa dirección, pero hasta no hace mucho teníamos que necesitábamos eh, de la ayuda de la geología y la ingeniería para decirles para decirles a dónde tenían que ir, ¿no es cierto? El, el, incluso cuando hablamos de geosteering, lo que estamos queriendo decir es que vamos a ir dirigiendo el pozo por donde eh, que, queremos o necesitamos que el pozo vaya, en la medida que encontramos nuevas formaciones, bueno, nuevas, quiero decir, en, en que vamos encontrando las formaciones, que vamos corrigiendo las posiciones de las mismas las profundidades y, y, y le, le, le vamos diciendo a dónde tienen que ir. Pero qué tal si en lugar de nosotros decirle, le hemos puesto todo ese input y le decimos, manéjese por esta capa que tiene estas características y eh, en cuanto a las características sean de una naturaleza, por ejemplo, más arcillosa, más y que tenga la capacidad de censarlo, que corrija hacia, hacia tal dirección, hacia arriba o hacia la derecha o lo que sea, y que eh, solo pueda manejarse. ¿no? O sea, todos estos son procesos evidentemente muy superiores a la automatización de los mecanismos, ¿no es cierto? Así que hemos traído dos expertos, que son el, el señor David Reed y el señor Schroeder Sudansen, que nos van a hablar hoy de eh, la automatización en los procesos de perforación. Les agradezco su presencia, esperamos seguir organizando más eventos como este, eh, y les quiero pasar un pequeño aviso, me han confirmado fechas para... La, el Congreso de Perforación va a ser dentro de casi un año, porque va a ser del 4 al 6 de noviembre del año que viene. Así que también vayan agendándose eso. Bueno, Eduardo, te, te dejo con la presentación. Muchas gracias. 
Buenos días a todos. Eh, vamos a hablar sobre David Reid primero, la vida y la carrera de David se ha centrado en el desarrollo de personas, negocio, tecnología y cultura. Ha sido pionero y defensor del crecimiento estratégico en tecnología, modelos comerciales, diseño de máquinas y digitalización industrial. Es un orador público mundial sobre innovación, cambios y liderazgo, además de ser un defensor para abordar la esclavitud moderna. David es miembro, es miembro del board de la Society of Petroleum Engineers, SPE, eh, es miembro del board de NOB y, un, y una empresa conjunta, IntelliServ, con Slumberger. Y también en ReadyMed, eh, que es un programa de recuperación sobre el trauma para sobrevivientes del tráfico sexual. Eh, algo bastante interesante y destacado, ¿no? David ha escrito muchos artículos técnicos en revistas de patentes, con patentes en sistemas de perforación y automatización, ha fundado grupos de la industria en tecnología, diversidad e inclusión y Red M, que es una organización de crowdsourcing pro bono. Es un miembro del equipo ganador del primer hackathon de Rocket and Rigs. Eh, con, una, eh, con una empresa nueva, una startup, Permitivity, basada en patentes de la NASA, que también forma parte de su directorio. Eh, vamos a hacer eh, este tipo, de esta, esta conferencia un poco más dinámica y, y dado el, el, el background que tienen los dos expositores que están buenos, eh, vamos a comenzar con la primera pregunta hacia David. Y para que no se asuste de tanto español, se la vamos a hacer en inglés. Uh, hi, David. Uh, what can you say about the impact in cost reduction with automation in the industry today, and in particular for non-conventional projects that we have a lot, uh, we, we think that we will have a lot here in Argentina with Baca Thank you. It's good to be here. Um, Historically, when we've done anything with automation, uh, we've we've gone after uh, machines and physical machines and large robots and applications, usually because the finances have been in, in deep water. Uh, the opportunity for us really has grown in the shale. It was actually our target as we began um, to to work with the shale. So let me let me open up my presentation. I'll, I'll tell you kind of the story of the journey here. So, um, here we go. Okay. So, when I started the company, in the company, it was around uh, 1992. By 93, I was in a repair workshop and I saw my first uh, automatic iron roughneck, the AR3000. Um, it was, uh, I expected a lot at that time. I thought it was going to be a full on robot, but really, it was very sensitive. At that time, at Varco, were making the computer itself. We were so early in the automation development, and it was really quite fragile. Uh, it wasn't really ready for oil and gas, but it got me interested seeing large robots potentially removing risk from the floor. And so they told me at that time that we were on a journey from mechanization to semi-automation to automation. That the language has evolved since then, but, but that was really what, how we saw our future at the time. But what surprised me was computer control and automation didn't get picked up. This is units sold in Iron Roughnecks. And so Iron Roughnecks really didn't become uh, standard until they came onto land rigs. And they didn't come onto land rigs until we had an ST80 machine. And the reason for that around 2000 was a lower cost and easier to use machine. And, and, and that really tells you something about automation. Um, automation is just a tool And understanding that is really important. Um, when you have uh, technology, it can help. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't really matter what it's called. Calling it automation isn't important. Uh, is it easy to use and does it help me to do the job? So it, we always say in technology, the first sale is to the CEO of a company. And the, the second and all the rest of the sales are to the rig crews. And if it doesn't make sense for a rig crew, Uh, it doesn't pick up. It doesn't go through that tip point in our industry where it gets bought in. So usability is really important. 
So something happened to me around the, the year 2000. We were all terrified that computing systems were going to collapse on us. And uh, many people became very nervous about computing and, and how much we were leaning on it. But for me, it became a moment where I realized the importance of computing. And so uh, I was working with a friend in MERS and, and really got to this idea of we need to stop thinking about machines and start thinking about software. So th around 2001, uh, we started to package in a way we never had. We started to pull together equipment. Now, NOV acquires lots of equipment. We, we, we buy companies and we develop technology. And so we were buying about a company a month and kept at that pace from about 2001 on. But it was all about the software for us. So we standardized rigs with this thing in mind, saying if we're going to have standard rigs, we'll be able to adapt software quickly between machines and systems. So that was a new thinking when we started moving towards more and more packaging in 2001. So now there was all those expensive rigs we built offshore, but what about low cost improvements? Did we learn something that actually can be applied? Well, when we started the automation journey about 10 years later, um, we really started going deep into how do we develop systems uh, that we can spread across the whole industry. For that to work, we had to have a low cost environment. And so all of our development targeted the U.S. shales, where it was really fast wells and very hard to justify new technology. Well, here we are in 2020 with 130 Novos systems, the majority of which are on land rigs. Uh, I think we have maybe 10 that are on offshore rigs, and they're being adapted and can do the offshore work. You see here a driller and his set of screens that he has to deal with. And so the Novos system actually is up there on the right. And that, that actually automates the whole process. So it makes it easier and better for the driller, installs in less than a day, and it lets apps from outsiders come in, which actually allows a market to develop for other people to keep improving the process. But it also fundamentally makes the drillers work better, and that's, that's what drove the technology from that, that moment. If you look at the driller himself in a conventional operation, he's got to improve drilling performance. He has to ensure the crew is safe. It sounds like two things that he has to do. But actually, when you look at his work, he has a lot of things to do. There are a lot of uh, components and buttons and things that he has to work on and calculate while he's looking at the well, as well as make sure that everyone is safe and that it all is adding up to performance. And it's, it's We lost uh, Dave. It's actually a very difficult job that we ask them to do. Yeah, can you hear me? David, we lost you. Uh, can you hear me? Now, yes. It's now? Okay. Okay, so he has to go through this process. Uh, it's very complicated. And what we've done is actually taken a system where there's a single button that can do all of those steps for him. And so that obviously makes this process simpler. When you look at the application itself, here is tagging bottom. We did this just as a test, having one of our best drillers continuously tag bottom in a 20-minute window. Um, he couldn't do the same thing. He's a good driller, but he couldn't do the same thing identically. Uh, he also couldn't get the efficiency that the automated system did. So we were going faster um, than the process was actually repeating better in a 20-minute cycle. So we also learned in tagging bottom but that was actually a failure area. Once we standardized the engagement of the bit with the rock, um, we found that with the Novos system, uh, there was actually less vibration as a result. So tagging bottom, it turned out, uh, was one of the reasons we were getting vibration in BHAs. And we've been spending all this money on our test rig trying to manage vibration inside of our BHA, when actually the simple task of tagging bottom uh, actually eliminated for us a lot of uh, the events related to vibration. So if you look there, there's 78% uh, of tag bottom incidents actually uh, became normal. If you look on the right with a regular driller, 63% were actually problematic when he was trying to get it right every time. So you start to see these other events start to happen where you're actually saving damage to your expensive systems just because you're using an automated system. If you look at it from a process standpoint, here's a repeated process by a regular driller, and then the Nova system with the driller. And what you find, of course, is consistency starts to happen. And when you start taking process and running consistency, um, as a manufacturer for us, we know that, that that means cost reduction because 
you don't have wait time anymore. So you start to manage your deliverables to the rig of service companies, cement crews, uh, casing. They all start to come without the windows that you used to have of days with people sitting around and start to turn up just in time. And that becomes more possible when you control your process. It also reduces a lot of cost out of your operations. So is that all? Are we just managing process? Well, there's more. And when you look at what we have been doing in our business, we continue to continually invest to get better. But ultimately, there comes a point where that investment flattens out on the returns that you can get, and you need new ways to apply. For a start with a Nova system, that, of course, allows you to bring in new apps, continually improve. But there were things we realized we had to do when it came to the well itself. And we started to use wired pipe and connect that to the surface. One of the benefits we started to see was the ability to actually repeatedly get the same result in the well. When the well can tell you exactly where you've done bit, it can tell you exactly what's happening up and down the well. Uh, we could sweep quickly, we could sweep faster, but all the rule of thumb work turned out had a lot of excess in it to protect us from problems. And so we could clean the well very well. We could know exactly when it was clean. We also avoided stuck pipe incidents. There was a lot of things started to happen, but most of all, we started to learn that there was accurate drilling we could do at much lower costs connecting the tools to the surface. So where do we go from there? Well, removing people from risk is also an opportunity once you have a process controller. Um, for us, this is still in development, but, but we found a way to do low cost pipe handling. Um, we actually have taken industrial robots, which are quite cheap, they're manufactured in high volumes, and learned how to let them do the work that the human beings are doing on the rig floor. That can still mean you're remote controlling them or you can automate them. But what it does mean is more consistency on the floor. You start to get all your operations uh, to work with a robotic controller. So for us, uh, I have just finished a well actually um, this morning on my test rig where uh, all of the pipe handling and tripping was done. Uh, using very low-cost robots without any any crew standing around the floor, which has made me feel more comfortable, uh, particularly when you're going through difficult uh, situations on the rig. So we're after that. You can remove also uncertainty in the equipment, and that's one of the things we've been working on for quite some time, where you start going from information about the systems to actually optimizing what they do. That's really a journey where you describe what happened in the past. You start to look at data. So the good news is if you have computers running anything on your rig, we can actually look at it. If you have sensors, we can look at it. And we can start to see when things fail, what's going on. We could start to diagnose why does it happen. And then you can start to predict what will happen in the future. And then it gets really exciting when you can say, how can we make what we want to happen happen? And so you start to prescribe operations as you have more data in the mix. For us, what that means, uh, we were looking at uh, BOPs originally. And now when we were changing out valves on the on the BOP, um, we would do it by time. And over as time went over time, we would continually change out uh, the BOP parts. When in reality, some of the BOP parts were actually going to fail independently, and we were able to tell when it could fail. And we were put in a position where we could tell a customer 14 days before something failed that it's going to fail, so they could start to look at spare parts actually being not held on the rig, but but close by. Uh, and not having to stop, and that it takes lots of cost out of your process. And then, of course, there's just the the general data systems. For us, we have three project products in this space, the Max Edge, Max Platform, and Max Portal. Um, and really what we learned was on all the devices that we make across drilling and completion and production, we were just talking about drilling. We also make things in all of these other areas, and we have control systems that run them. What The opportunity for us was to say, okay, we have at least 300 companies that we bought, all with different control systems. Can we get a system to communicate with all of them so that everyone can have more data? So we started looking at having edge devices where we standardize them across everything that we manufacture. So we make completion systems, we make uh, coil tubing and production systems as well as drilling. And we're able to actually take all of that data and normalize it. And we can do this for third parties as well. So we start being able to gather uh, data over into a platform that can be viewed in the cloud or at the well site. Obviously, we're doing talking about max computing at the well site. Uh, but then the data scientists can actually get involved and feedback information to the application. And ultimately, um, we're looking at a place where you'll actually be able to view 
remotely as well as uh, at the well itself, uh, typical EDR type information, so normal drilling recorders, but you're able to do that across your whole fleet. In fact, you start looking at a well and all of its performance. And what that does is it means we can start to engage more people uh, with software solutions, feeding things to the operations, giving them tools that will continuously evolve. Uh, uh, but if you create this network, it means you've got this potential to do this at pretty low cost. Uh, you already have had the heavy expense of, of putting in computer controls on your systems, and then this is really just a, a matter of gathering that data and giving people tools to actually feed things that can help the field to perform better. And then ultimately, the big question everyone wants to know is, can we, can we in the future see ourselves closing the whole loop, meaning can we look at uh, well data while we're drilling and actually take the models that the, the geologists have been using and say, we're not just going to geosteer, we're going to actually plan and map and change the model as we drill. And that would include going back into performance of past wells and looking at what is the optimal performance of the total uh, reservoir or application. And that gets really exciting because all of these things exist. We're not talking about making them. We're talking about connecting them and then adding advanced analytics to be able to do something with that. And so with that, I will close my presentation. So that was, that's my main story. Tu microphone non sta prendito, Fernando. Okay, thank you, David. I had a question prepared, which probably most of it you have already answered, but uh, uh, I have another question too. So, uh, first, what is the level of automation today? Uh, meaning, uh, how much these technologies are penetrating the market? Mm -hmm. And the second question I have, if I can throw it now, is uh, I saw your driller in, in the in the picture in your presentation, and I was thinking on whether these kind of drillers that uh, we need now with these technologies are the ones we've got now in the field. Do we need to better prepare our drillers? Do we need those drillers now to be like uh, graduated engineers, uh, or, or can we use the, the ones that we, we've got now to 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 be there one day? I think I think the best answer is that we keep planning on keeping the same drillers. There will be some that will struggle um, with the technology, which is always the case. Um, but for the most part, I think uh, I know when we when we run I run a test rig with all this technology on it. Um, we just took a new driller straight out of the field, and um, he, he was, he's been great. Um, has an aptitude, does really well. I think the modern driller is used to the technology, which used to be our problem, you know, a few decades ago. Um, so they're starting to get used to just the technology, and what this really does is helps them do their job. And so um, often, what it does. Uh, there used to be a tension between the service company and the driller. This actually gives a lot of the information to the driller. So a lot of the guesswork that was happening or the calculations in the background uh, that the driller would have to be subject to, they actually have the data now. Especially if you're running with wired pipe, you're seeing the well, so you know what's happening. And so there's a lot less guesswork. And now there are tools that help that driller to make decisions. So my belief is the current driller will become more empowered and do more work that previously someone came to his rig to do. So uh, we see we see um, we see acceptance where we see barriers. I mean, if you look, that's 130 applications. Um, there's more coming. Um, we do it offshore. Obviously, there's a lot more comfort, but there's a lot more money in the offshore business. But but when we do it on land rigs, the the successful ones are the ones where you spend time uh, with the drillers. You do training. I know we've done our first job with San Antonio there in Argentina, and uh, we ran some automated MPD, and we have a Nova system on one of their rigs. They, um, the, the main struggle has been the training of the driller, and I think every time we sit there, it's not, it's not at the point where you can just turn it on and the driller's comfortable, because it is a change in how he works. Um, but it is doing the training work, and once the training work is done, um, for the example of MPD, I mean, you can run managed pressure drilling without the eight people coming out with the equipment. Uh, you can actually have the system do the calculation and have some remote connectivity, maybe one or two guys overseeing, but not the same crowd. 
So what happens is the drill crew starts to manage a lot more of the service business work um, because they have the tools to do it. So I think it's very feasible um, that the current drillers will adapt very well to the technology. And if they don't, it's kind of like our iPhone, how much training did we have? You know, most of it should come naturally. Does that make sense? Uh, that, that's a good answer using the iPhone uh, as, as an example. I uh, remember that Steve Jobs used to say that it is more intuitive than what you would think. Okay, and the first question was that, well, well what is the the, uh, the level of expansion of this uh, technology, uh, this automation? Uh, it's, it's running, you know, the places you normally, we did start a lot in the U.S. shales. Um, we're, we're doing some very complex offshore work in Norway uh, and in uh, in the U.K. sector. But you're seeing it in the Middle East. We're, we're running some of our first uh, closed loop uh, jobs in Saudi, uh, where we've got a Nova system at wire pipe running. And so that's been a progression. And, and usually a, a great way to adapt these things is progression, as well as motive. So for example, San Antonio's motive was really to manage pressure drilling uh, and running it automatically. But they also have a Nova system now that can improve their tripping, improve all sorts of operations. And we have people looking at wire pipe in Argentina now as well. As that continues to get, we've had reliability uh, improve over time with wire pipe. And you're going to see it get down to almost like buying regular pipe, uh, where the, as the price continues to go down um, on wire pipe applications. And so that, that's going to become a lot more normal for people to run. And so, um, but it's really not about the technology itself as it is. Does it help the driller do his job? Like I, like I said in the presentation, you can sell it to a corporate office, but if the driller doesn't like it, he's going to find a way for it not to work. <clears throat> and generally, that's that's all been about talking to them about this doesn't mean your job goes away, because that's the number one fear with automated systems. And what it really means is it augments your job, and that's that's the right word more than automation is augmenting the work of people. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay, thank you. That answers very well the question. Um, in, um, this question for David, what is your experience on how the accommodation of the rig affect the human resource in the industry? If you can explain a little bit about, uh, a little bit more about that because sometimes most of the people are very worried about what happened with automation how it's going to affect in the real life of them and the loss of jobs. Mm -hmm. So maybe you have a vision about that. Well, I think I think jobs change is what happens. I mean, there's still work to be done um, around the rig. There's still, these are, even if you have machines running, you have to maintain the machines, you have to look after them. There's still those kind of jobs. And um, the more dangerous jobs will go away, and I think that's a good thing. Um, I know this well we were just doing, we had a 13,000 foot well up in Navasota and uh, the team was talking and they're used to having, we actually have a mechanical arm up on the fingerboard. And uh, the question was, uh, what if we're gonna try this new robot? What if the robot fails? Um, and the, what they were, they're planning to do was replace it with the mechanical arm. So they're, they've been so used to not tripping uh, mechanically, but they don't see that as an option and they don't really want to go back there from just a safety and risk standpoint. So that's that's an interesting change in, in crew over a few years of just working with a, with a fully automated system. When we went offshore originally, the story was we're going to put these machines out. I think about 86, the first machine was all integrated. Uh, the whole crew isn't needed anymore. Um, maybe we need some on the floor. And the truth was, the crews didn't get smaller. You know, they, they got, some of them got smarter. There was definitely an education process that had to happen on learning how to work with these systems. And there was a bit more computer knowledge needed. As we've gone into Novos, we actually have um, headsets that we give people that fit on a hard hat, which actually have an AI component, um, which means that because we didn't have the people to run around all of these jobs around the world, um, and so the best answer was to have remote support, and that's really become the answer you're going to see. People don't have to be as high-skilled. They just have to have a connection to someone. And uh, with these headsets, they actually have can see what they're looking at. They can see into uh, what's behind this, what's, what's the task, what's the next thing I'm supposed to do. 
So that technology probably is going to help a lot. Um, we did it out of necessity, but I think people are going to get very comfortable with uh, with using technology that connects you um, back to uh, to experts when you need it. And I think I think we're going to see more of that. Okay. Uh, David, you you remind me in the eighties a rig a platform rig an offshore rig you say used to have a bed space of about sixty something. Yes. It was normal. Mm -hmm. All the automation came in, and the best space now in a rig, and you are always short on that, it's 150. Yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> we, well, we're using a lot more people. What, what happens is that we are, we are processing a lot more uh, information, and we are acquiring much, much more information, and we are able to reach uh, uh, fields or uh, reservoirs that we were unable to to, to get before. I think that's right. But I think a lot of that bed space is service companies that have found ways to create value. Um, I think you're going to see that decrease. That's that's a place rigs will not have people running out with their own special box uh, to plug in anymore. I think you're going to start to see downloadable apps uh, and systems will come and they'll remote watch. So, so experts don't have to stand there anymore. On my test rig right now, I'm working on removing the, the drillers. Now that I have robots running, I'm going to take the drillers cabin off. Um, just because in a well control event, why wouldn't you? If you have good cameras and there, there are robots working, why wouldn't you have a remote uh, cabin? And if you've ever been through a blowout where things went wrong, uh, you know that's the right answer, is that it's, we've got to keep people safe. And so if we can do our work, uh, remotely, and you know, when things are safe, go up and, and do other work. So I still think we don't have to solve BHA, making BHAs, or because you know, usually you're in a safe condition. But when you're in drilling, you're being in a position where people can be far from the operation. Uh, that's going to just that's just wisdom for us. As as you know, if we have the technology, let's do it right. So I think that's kind of our next step. Well, uh, I have a more question for you, David, but we will let to the end. Uh, so be prepared for answer what the okay. NOV is doing. But uh, we will give the time for Sridhar uh, in order that he start his presentation also. And then we, we gave the space for both of you to explain a little bit about NOV and uh, spark cognition. So I'll go ahead with Sridhar Sordan. Uh, I will uh, give the, the, the CV of Sridhar in Spanish for the audience. Eh, Sudar Sudarsam, el director de tecnología de Spark Cognition, es responsable de conducir Spark Cognition en estrategia de productos y tecnología, aprovechando inteligencia artificial de, de la próxima generación y sistema para asegurar y optimizar activos en, en industrias clave. Ha, lider, ha liderado las innovaciones tecnológicas de Spark Cognition y oferta de productos de gran escala en algunas de las mayores empresas de petróleo y energía del mundo. Con más de dos décadas de tecnología, experiencia de liderazgo, Sudarsan ha, sido, ha estado al frente de varios productos complejos y proyectos, colaborando con clientes globales en tecnología de vanguardia. Previamente, Sudarsan fue CTO de IBM Watson Platform and Partnership. No sé si todos recuerdan Watson, eh, la plataforma Watson, muy, muy interesante, ¿no? Este, donde dirigió la tecnología, estrategia y arquitectura de la plataforma IBM de Watson. Eh, Sudarsam eh, es ampliamente reconocido como un experto en el potencial eh, empresarial y la aplicación de tecnologías avanzadas, proporciona liderazgo intelectual en soluciones y patrones de inteligencia artificial para clientes, socios académicos, y equipos de investigación y desarrollo. Posee más de 14 patentes en áreas de inteligencia artificial e informática distribuida y ha publicado informes técnicos y artículos para una variedad de medios y ha sido un orador destacado en conferencias en universidades. Eh, los dejo a ustedes con uh, Sudarsan uh, eh, y vamos a disparar con la pregunta What is the status of machine learning? An artificial intelligence in doing that uh, application uh, for you, Sridhar. Welcome. Excellent. 
Um, well, good morning, uh, and thank you for that introduction, and thank you for having me, David. Uh, that was an excellent, uh, you know, uh, overview and positioning in terms of automation and in, uh, in drilling. So, um, to your uh, to your point, what I will do today is I'll discuss a little bit about kind of what the you know some of the applications. I mean, if, I think if you start talking about all the different areas where artificial intelligence technologies, machine learning can be applied in drilling, I think it'll be very long. So what I was, rather than going through every single one of them or many of these, I thought I'll pick a couple and just highlight sort of what we have done as far cognition and, uh, and, and just go maybe a little bit deeper into a couple of the areas. And then we can open it up for a question in about 15 minutes or so. So, um, so first, uh, just uh, introducing who we are as a company. I think um, our um, we are a, a startup, so to speak, from our mindset, but we're about seven years old. Um, and our focus is really around building uh, AI platforms that is focused for industrial areas, right? And, and when we think about industrial areas, oil and gas is one of our biggest focus areas and is our largest sort of uh, client base. But we also um, do service, uh, you know, a broader energy space. We do focus on manufacturing, automotive, aviation, and others. Uh, and in, within this, you know, obviously AI can be applied in a lot of different areas, but we really try to drive um, minimizing downtime, maximizing uptime, and really focusing on improving optimization and security. And, and so that's, that's kind of where we uh, really drive and really focus on. Um, so I want to talk about a couple of things that we've done in the offshore space first. Uh, you know, one, some work that we've done with BP, and then this work uh, we did with Aqua BP in the North Sea for unmanned platforms. But uh, as you're all in general sort of working on a number of different areas around, uh, you know, the, in the SPE, um, I, I thought it would be interested, interesting for, for me to share a, a couple of things in this space. So one, um, <clears throat> as you know, um, the fact that some of these uh, offshore platforms not being available can be a major challenge. And why is that? Because obviously of uh, cost implications, but more importantly, when there is a problem, there are sustainability impact, there is safety impact, um, and, and that's something that has been uh, addressed for many decades through using physics-based approaches. And what that gives you is it gives you some, um, you know, sort of forewarning. It gives you some predictability in terms of, uh, uh, you know, warnings in terms of when there is a potential maintenance issue, when a compressor is going to go down, when there's going to be a problem in a, in a pump, for example, and it could sort of lead to downtimes. So what we did uh, a few years ago um, was we took a very different sort of machine learning based approach where uh, knowing that these incidents don't happen that much, the traditional approaches of machine learning really apply supervised approaches. So what that means is you need many, many examples of a problem before you can start teaching the, uh, you know, the uh, underlying sort of algorithms on how to look for a specific example or how to look for a specific problem. Unfortunately, as you know, these problems don't happen that frequently. So we actually took uh, a very different sort of unsupervised set of approaches. And in particular, there's one technique that we applied called normal behavior modeling. So what does that do? Uh, what, it, what it really does is it, it looks at how a system is actually running and how a system is operating. And it tries to essentially find what is normal when the system is running. So, for example, if you take a compressor, if you take a pump, if you take a, um, uh, you know, an entire platform that has multiple different assets within that, you take a turbine, uh, what we start doing is we have um, a technology that can read sensor data at rapid streaming rates. And then we model how the system is behaving and we model how the system is performing and we try and determine what normal is. Then we compute the difference of exactly how the system is performing at that point and we find the difference and that's the risk of that system at that point in time. Because these are all mechanical systems, they do tend to degrade over time. 
So when you degrade over time, what happens is the risk is very slowly growing. And so that's the thing that is very hard for a human or a set of humans or statistical techniques to be able to process. And that's the kind of thing that we uh, process with our one of our products called Spark Predict. And that's what we've actually applied both at BP here in the Gulf of Mexico and then in this Acre BP platform called Tambar um, in the Gulf, uh, in the North Sea. And in both cases, um, you know, it was really about trying to determine and predict these problems beforehand. So, um, you know, David, you talked about some examples uh, in terms of getting predictive visibility. Uh, in these cases, what we actually were able to do is get um, the the prediction in terms of failures about 10 to 14 days in advance, 10 to 14 days. So in the case of Acre BP, what you see here on the right, uh, this Tambar platform is an unmanned platform, and it's obviously being able to just schedule uh, a, a person, as a technician, to go look at one of those multi-phase pumps that they have uh, is a three-day exercise. So imagine getting a, a notification about 14 days or so ahead of time it can allow you to preempt and prevent some of these challenges. So that's, um, you know, a couple of the key examples that I wanted to highlight. And if you think about sort of the, the focus of why would you want to do this, obviously cost is a big aspect, um, you know, in, in one of the cases where uh, each incident can potentially um, uh, impact and cause a value proposition of about, uh, you know, a few $10 million. So across the entire platform asset for companies as large as BP and, and others, uh, you know, that, that cost savings itself can be in the, you know, in the high hundreds of millions of dollars. But that's not the most important thing. That is obviously very important, but not the only thing. Uh, because the second key aspect is really around sustainability. Because obviously when you're, especially when you're in the offshore space, um, you know, including in the land, but certainly more so in the offshore space, you don't want these kinds of uh, incidents, uh, production impacting incidents to cause, um, uh, you know, uh, major sort of catastrophic events. And then, of course, safety, because, you know, we, we spent a few minutes earlier talking about number of humans actually increasing, uh, albeit doing sort of different types of roles, um, but it is about sort of uh, making sure that you provide a safe uh, and a secure environment for the individuals that are involved as well. So, so let's talk about uh, you know another uh, use case that I'll, I'll 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 go through, which is around drilling. So, if you think about sort of uh, drilling itself, uh, you know obviously there are a number of different areas that there are challenges with. Uh, specifically, if you think about sort of mechanical stocking, uh, sticking. Uh, or if you think about sort of uh, differential sticking type issues that occur. But one of the main areas that, you know, we have tried to apply, and this is a pretty complex problem because we took multiple different attempts at doing this as well, and, and many of you probably are, are uh, you know, way more familiar about this than I do because you probably are working firsthand in some of these things. But if you think about sort of what, as a driller, what do you really monitor on the rig? Uh, it is about sort of a lot of these surface parameters, right? Whether it's the RPM, whether it's the control, whether it is the flow, uh, I'm sorry, whether it is the, the flow, um, whether it is the, uh, you know, the, the block positions, um, et cetera. And the readings that you work on are really the surface readings, right? And if you think about what the surface readings are, they could be, you know, uh, bit, tap, uh, bit depth or torque or, um, or the pressure, uh, hook loads, et cetera. And, and the challenge has been always about how can you quickly get these surface readings and then be able to sort of analyze that to then be able to potentially, uh, you know, uh, try and identify a stuck pipe situation uh, as soon as you can, right? And obviously you all know the implications of kind of what the issues are and what kind of challenges that occur uh, because of that. So what did we do? We took an interesting sort of modeling approach here. And uh, as part of our uh, approach, uh, what we did was we tried to mimic the behavior of, uh, of essentially drillers using very uh, small amounts of data. So just minimalistic data, uh, only surface parameters in this particular case. And, and then what we did was, as I'd explained earlier, we took this approach of an unsupervised learning using normal behavior modeling 
and we tried to identify very, very small deviations. So as, as I mentioned, we look at the uh, surface parameters, we, and you obviously can constantly monitor that and you can constantly measure, uh, 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 you know, get access to that kind of information. And then using NBM, we were able to find not the core and the, uh, the actual values, but the relative changes in the values. So these deviations that we did, we were then able to model sort of what normal looks like. And normal, I think, for us as humans, uh, what is visible to our human eyes a little bit different from kind of what you would see a machine being able to do that. And then what we were able to do was we were able to leverage, um, you know, auto ML. So even within machine learning, there's a category around auto machine learning, which is automatic uh, model building abilities to be able to improve these models because you obviously are generating a large number of models. And then as you get more exposure to data, we were able to sort of add um, additional uh, models that we were able to tweak and tune. So what this does then is that the ML abilities, the, uh, the uh, machine learning models that we have, they flag these deviations from normal as a, uh, as a risk score. And then we set some thresholds and then that's when they would send the alerts to, uh, to the different sort of systems. Uh, into determining sort of uh, potential risk scores which reflect the anomalies within the stuck pipe scenario. So that's kind of the, the general broad approach that we took. Um, <clears throat> and we've actually seen some very, very interesting sort of results that came from that. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, we did a, a large number of data integrity analysis where, <clears throat> uh, as you know, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the big challenges with the uh, with any kind of machine learning approaches that you take is that you need to have sort of some reasonable consistency within the data. And if you think about the kinds of systems involved, they're not always, you, you, there is some missingness in data. Not all sensors sort of stream data at the same time. You know, there is sort of slight variations in offsets that you see. So what we do then is in our systems uh, on our side and the algorithmic side, before we apply some of these algorithms, we try and, um, and manage uh, to the data cleansing and the data integrity. Because once you can verify and uh, um, get sort of veritable data, once you can trust the data, that's when you can do sort of some interesting things with it. You can apply some samplings. You can try a lot of different sort of aggregations. You can do a bunch of time series analysis because these are all timestamp based. And then once you have these things that are checked, that's when you run the algorithms on it, <clears throat> and then you flag the, uh, the right kinds of alerts to the right kinds of systems and so on. <clears throat> so this was sort of one of the things that we did. <clears throat> and then in the modeling itself, just to show you kind of how the entire workflow would work, um, obviously, uh, as I said, we measure not just the, the core specific values of the data, but we work on the changes, for example, the change in the hook load or the change in the RPM or torque or blocks, uh, positions and so on, and uh, find sort of where the inconsistencies are. So just real quickly, I want to explain to you what the um, architecture itself would look like. So obviously you have a width small store. I mean, it could be a different store, but with, uh, with SML is a very common uh, sort of paradigm. We have a connector that we have set up for it. There's a series of feature engineering that we do, as I described, we resample the timing, uh, we find sort of what the rolling window features are, uh, we scale up or down some of these samples, and then we impute missing values. So which means if there are missing values, we try and determine what would be the best values to, uh, to fill in there. Uh, and then we sort of take in as an input, you know, a number of sort of rich uh, config parameters for the state of the rig itself. We, we cluster these in a number of different areas. We then run that through the uh, NBM models, which is a part of, uh, uh, you know, one of the techniques. And it's not the only one, but it is one of the key techniques that we use. Uh, and then we sort of determine what are the, uh, the raw uh, risk that we are generating from these. And then how do you essentially drive uh, a, a probability of an alert? Because what you also don't want it to, is to have too many false positives which means you don't want to alert on things that you that aren't really, uh, you know, real, if you will, or real issues. Um, and, and you can sort of vary the windows of your thresholds of uh, what your risk score or risk uh, 
uh, management uh, capabilities are. And, uh, and that's when you, you essentially generate sort of some of these alerts uh, at certain time windows. So as you can imagine, this entire piece, while it sounds very uh, you know, complex, is what we have encapsulated within our product called Spark Predict uh, for drilling. And that's what we make available uh, in, in the drilling scenario. So it's actually been some very interesting results that we've seen where it has been able to uh, identify and catch these events ahead of time and be able to provide the right kinds of alerts. So, um, so that's sort of a, a specific uh, area. And as I mentioned, uh, in terms of the classification model itself, if we encapsulate that entire thing as a sort of a simplistic view, this is how the alert classification model looks like. And then, um, you know, essentially, as I said, uh, we generate uh, the slope of the risk score within that window and then determine sort of how many alerts that you want to generate and how much in advance do you want to generate there. Um, so uh, just real quick to show you a few different ways. This is another product that we have called Darwin. As I mentioned, when you use an auto uh, NBN or an automatic uh, machine learning approaches, automated machine learning approaches where you can run a large number of different types of uh, you know, classification and a large number of uh, models at the same time to find what is the best score that you can get. Um, this is our product called Darwin, which allows you to do that and run this sort of uh, classification approaches in a, uh, within the rig state and be able to sort of use these input values that are essentially surface parameters and be able to generate, uh, you know, what would be the best model within that context, within that particular rig. It's not a one size fit all. It's never sort of, you know, the exact same thing. So obviously the geological conditions, uh, the geophysical conditions are different. And, you know, what you see, for example, in, uh, uh, you know, in, in South America is different from, let's say, what you see in the Middle East is different from what you see in other areas. So I think those are also factors that do impact, which is why you need this automation, because otherwise these things can take very, very can be very time consuming and very painful and almost impossible to scale uh, with uh, only human beings, right? So that's, that's sort of one of the challenges that we see, which we've addressed with that. Uh, and, and this is really just showing you some of the outcomes and the results of what we saw in the ROP optimization results in some of the examples and uh, how we were able to do it in a, in a small sort of five minute span. Um, and where we were able to generate it over, you know, even a small number of uh, random samples that we did. Um, and then just one last thing that I will talk about here is um, a, a slightly different sort of angle to this. So we talked about taking sensor and time series data. We talked about looking at automatically generating models using Darwin. Uh, this is another uh, capability that we have, which allows you to classify uh, the drilling operation codes based on description. So obviously, as you're familiar with this, uh, there's there's a large number of sort of these descriptions that are provided and, and uh, created. And what you really want to do is automatically classify some of these. So the deep NLP, NLP stands for natural language processing. So what the deep NLP product that we have does is it takes these unstructured data. So these sentences and text is really unstructured. And it takes these description, which doesn't really have as much detail all the time, right? Sometimes some people add more details than others have less, less details, depending on what else is going on. But what DeepNLP allows you to do is to take these descriptions and with some examples, once we show it, what the class and the subclass uh, or the code and the subcode look like, then it can run that through, you know, hundreds of thousands of these descriptions and be able to correctly, um, fairly well actually classify these results, right? And I think that's the, uh, the, the, the statistics in, in sort of some of the examples that we've run that I'm showing you where, you know, we classified it about 90% of the time, over 90% of the time. And not just the code and the subcode, but when we took the code and the subcode, because now that's sort of adding another layer of, um, uh, of classification, we were able to do that as well, uh, you know, over 80% of the time, right? 85% of the time. So I think the good news is that, um, uh, there's a number of different data types that we are receiving from these kinds of scenarios. And there are different machine learning pipelines that we have, um, we've built over time, uh, whether it is for time series data using Spark Predict or structured data using Darwin or unstructured data using DeepNLP. 
and uh, and really using this augmented human intelligence along with sort of machine and sensor data to actually better optimize some of these uh, operations that we're talking about. So that's really the key uh, message and the key takeaway that I want to leave you all with. There's a number of state-of-the-art uh, technologies in terms of just uh, types of algorithms and approaches that we've taken. As you can see, uh, it's slightly different from the typical machine learning and, uh, and AI techniques that you're probably used to where you're just saying, throw every data in and we'll get some magic out of it. It's not that, right? Because in this practical scenario, um, as humans, um, we only have visibility into a small number of data sets and a small number of patterns. Uh, and so in this case, for example, in drilling, we said that we only took the surface control and surface parameters and we tried to model it with just that. And, it, and the results are very, very encouraging. And I think that's uh, just something that uh, uh, we're, we're actually working on with, with customers as well. So, um, so with that, I will um, sort of end my uh, uh, end my presentation uh, side of the story that I wanted to share with you all, and uh, turn it back to you to see uh, if you have any questions. Yeah, Sridhar, I have a question just uh, from the last slide. If we, if I understood well. Uh, the system can do the daily reports base it on the on the sensor on the rig real time it sounds like that that is correct, that is, correct. That is very useful i guess a lot of drillers will be very interested in that uh, and the more important thing that is not a person is a machine which take the information of the sensor and that would be very important to do the uh, optimization of the system and to take care of, of uh, how what we can adjust with that. And that's with exactly that question, right. With that question, uh, and, uh, and I like it that very much, and I think that a lot of drillers will be very happy with that, because I don't know what they're going to do now, but uh, they will look at what's going on. Uh, the question for David is what NOV is doing with uh, that information and what NOV uh, has uh, already uh, as automa automation in the drilling rig at this moment. Well, for the for the main <clears throat> the main value we're bringing. I mean, obviously we already have remote control capability, but the uh, the Nova system gives you um, process control. So the the role of the driller is a lot more focused on the right tasks. And I, I think yeah, Sridhar would say the same thing. Is that Absolutely. what we're doing is targeting uh, the the value of the driller. And what's the most valuable thing he can do? Whereas repetitive tasks, no, not not so valuable. If you give him more information, uh, he can advance the well. He can make sure everything uh, is done much more efficiently. The the downtime will will be affected, and then the performance will improve. And and that makes drillers happy with more data to help them do what they need to do. Uh, writing a report, how valuable is that compared to looking at the data and confirming? Yeah, that's that's what happened in amending it. Does that make sense, Sridhar? It absolutely does, and and you're right, David. Is that it is really not that the role of the drillers is uh, is reducing. It's actually getting more focused because uh, one of the things is some of these sort of more mundane, uh, repetitive activity is what is being automated. So as you said, connecting to the data and getting the right kind of data. Once we set up those connections. We actually have systems that can read the streaming data, and as I mentioned, we, we now have a WITSMO uh, connector as well, and so we can read through that and let the system process that. The challenge has been that we have had you know people that are looking at a lot of information and trying to make sense of it. Now we're focusing people to look at the right information and take the action that they're you know better designed to take, which the system is not able to understand and do as much of that, right? So we're mm -hmm. We're sort of almost um, uh, expanding the the degree of sort of uh, uh, specificity and focus for the drillers to be operating while we're sort of moving down in the stack, in the technology stack, the, the more sort of heavy duty lifting, if you will, uh, in this particular case of the data analysis and the data movement and the data uh, model building and all of that good stuff. So I think that's why it's always going to be the a combination of the human with the systems and with yeah. the machines. 
and mm. you're keeping continuously raising the bar of what the humans need to be doing by pushing some of these things down in the system. I think that's really the way that we look at it and how we're seeing it, um, you know, uh, occur in most of the customers and, and companies that we're working with. Sridhar, yeah. can I just jump in? Please. What, what, um, is a question. Uh, are, are you looking at with the, uh, and natural language processing does for for the Argentinians connecting to the u s and learning from each other does that actually allow a natural connection from going to from Spanish to English yeah so nLP can um, do Spanish as well I mean I think we support about uh, thirty odd languages and Spanish is certainly one of them so yes yeah, so if you're making notes or you know even speaking with in Spanish. We can capture that, we can convert it into English, and we can do the processing and then reconvert it into Spanish so that the insights are generated in the right language. So, yeah, absolutely. My, my question is, uh, what about the machine, uh, machine uh, language yeah, to yeah. connect what you are seeing of the rig yes, with the yeah. automation of the rig yeah. in order to you're, you're, take you're advantage gonna... and try to improve uh, the rate of penetration, for example? There's a there's a really great piece uh, that um, called the Sheridan model, and, and and basically allows you to understand the process of moving from a human being doing work to working with computers and what they can do. And there's stages along there, and uh, as you progress and you start to trust the system, uh, the more you move towards okay, I'm going to let the computer have control, and ultimately the computer decides when you need to hear something or don't need to hear something. And that, that progression is really interesting. And we're, we're, we're moving along that. And we're definitely not at the point where, you know, and I don't think we will be where people, just like airplanes, we're not going to be comfortable with, with just saying, let's, let's just let the computers do the work. And we're always, because the earth is so variable, we're always going to be watching it and the risk is too high. So, so there will always be some level of human engagement just because of the risk. Do you agree with that, Sridhar? Absolutely. And I think you're, you're correct. And, you know, even before we started the conference, we were talking about cars and cars driving themselves. And, uh, it's the same yeah. thing, right? Is, uh, while they do that, steel, steel, and, steel. Yeah, yeah, while you can do that, but there's still the need. And I think it's going to be a while before we're all comfortable just not even sitting in the front seat and letting the cars drive itself. Right. So I think those are the kinds of challenges that we're facing. And it's a little bit different if you think about from an, uh, from a train versus an right. airplane versus a car. Yeah. And, and why is the difference there? Because on a train, in, a, in the case of a train, you, it, it's a lot more common to see completely unmanned and automated sort of systems. Why? Because the operating route is, and especially you see this in many airports, right? And if you look at transfer, transfer between terminals, you have these trains that run without any human, at least a human sort of operating it on the train, and the reason is because there, there's very little sort of variables and, and uh, changes that occur because they're constantly operating on the single track or, or the two uh, sort of parallel rails. In the case of a car, obviously, as, as we were talking earlier, there's so many parameters. So in, in certain conditions, in many conditions, you'll get sort of the 60% of it right, but the 40% of the conditions can be very catastrophic and can be very painful. It's the mm -hmm. same thing with airplanes because there's a third degree of dimension that you're adding, which is your uh, height and your yaw, uh, which can also be very impactful. So when you're sort of flying in, a, in an autopilot, you can operate in many conditions. The reason you still have the pilots that are always there is to take care of some of these sort of variable conditions. I think it's the mm -hmm. same kind of thing in the rigs. It's a lot closer to these sort of unknowns that we're just about beginning to learn about and trying to address some of the common things to get it close to doing autopilot, even in some conditions. I think we're yeah. kind of at that stage. It's going to take us, you know, a while before we understand some of the more nuances in this in this area. I have a question from the audience uh, for David. Is what is being done to balance the need of high tech and the need for simple part to warranty operational continuity? That's good. That's a good Argentina question because um, we, we struggle with that. The, um, what we're doing now is starting to move to a more B2B business type technologies where we can actually know where parts are, including our customer base. So it's actually requiring us to understand who's got what, where, um, and then some investment, of course, in the country and saying, okay, we're going to have to have the right support. So it's a mix of working in 
uh, operations technologies as well as having the right people there. So we, we are looking at um, having, uh, we have automation um, service contracts where we can help manage the, the technical side as well as the parts side. And so there's a lot more happening right now in uh, in our operations as everyone's trying to work through hard times. And so there's a lot more work looking at, you know, using the uh, tracker vision, which is the headsets that I talked about, making sure that we get support remotely for people when they need it, as well as having people in country and then parts managing across the country. And that's that's just the reality of, of trying to work right now in, in the space. And so we're, we're definitely got a lot of focus with our customers on that and trying to improve that. Because once you get that done, uh, you're right. If we can't have all the machines working because we don't have the parts, that's a challenge. But if we can actually predict better and use systems in our favor, I think it does get better. Okay. Uh, I have another question from Ivan Cosentino for Spidal. Uh, how would you handle for the deep NLP model for the operation that have barely any surface surface parameter? fingerprint. Are you using any information coming out of the standard WSF TMSL stream, uh, such as VOP test, uh, pack off, sitting, and so on? Absolutely. So we are using information coming out of the uh, Witsmo stream. So similar to kind of what I showed you, where once we set up the connection, we actually have a connector now to with SML that we've set up, and so it can read through information coming from there directly. The other thing is, um, it's a good question on the deep NLP. If you don't have sort of a uh, a sufficient fingerprint. <clears throat> you don't need to use all of the different layers, right? So what we are constantly trying to do is trying to get sort of the most optimal results with the minimal amount of, uh, you know, uh, uh, density of data and, and number of parameters that we're getting. So at some point there will be a trade-off and a balance, right? And, and in terms of if you're obviously not collecting anything, then it's almost as good as a guess, and that's not going to give you sort of the right degree of in, uh, efficiency or, or uh, right degree of alerting capability, but that's the that's the tri uh, that's the sort of balance that we continuously try to uh, ascertain is once we have access to a lot, can we get the right results? Step one. Step two. For the same results, can we reduce the number of inputs so that we can try and address it in a variety of different types of environments? Step three is, can we sort of assume that we're, we're going to even skinny down the version of inputs more so, and can we live with sort of even satisfactory results? Because sometimes with the stuck pipe scenarios, the reaction time that you have is so low that anything you get is better than nothing at all, right? So I think that's the trade-off that we constantly see, and as, uh, as we said earlier, because the geology is different and the, the types of equipments are different in many areas, the sophistication of data you collect is different. Uh, it, it's something we're sort of, it, it's not a one size and a, as a, just a single thing and we throw it at it, throw at it and it, it comes out. But it's something we've developed now multiple times to where we are beginning to get a good understanding of how we can vary these things. So we can start seeing some results fairly quickly, right? At least initial results that then can be validated by the right drilling people to ensure if that's good enough or you need sort of more uh, more efficiencies there and that's not, not enough for you and not sufficient. So I think those are types of things that we continuously engage with the, with the drilling SMEs uh, to be able to get to that. Okay, thank you, Shreda. It, it came to my mind the idea because I deal every day with uh, uh, daily reports, and uh, one of the things they, is that uh, the, the the report would have the color of the company man that is writing it, and uh, and then it makes it one of them uh, uh, absolutely detailed uh, on on things that you may not need even, and uh, and the other one joining all operations together in one phrase, you know, something. Then you have to educate them. So uh, this system is quite attractive because it it, it makes it so standard, probably that uh, I guess. Uh, and so then I can find operations uh, with a regular um, a searcher uh, of characters or or traces, and and then I can find when the BOP BOP was tested or when. Uh, 
uh, we picked uh, what, what was the, 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 the pickup weight uh, at such a moment, you know, easily instead of searching on all that. So my question is uh, whether this has been already tested in, in, in an actual operation. It has. Um, it has. I can I can share where and with who yet, but uh, it has been and is actually actually currently also being worked on with uh, in in a in a real operation in actually multiple real operations. So um, it is uh, as you said quite, with the way that we've built it. I mean, we've been learning it as we go along, right? As I said, we're mm-hmm. sort of drilling experts, but we're working with the drilling experts to ensure that this is something. To your point, is is helpful to them and is giving them sort of the gaps that they didn't have uh, so far, and uh, and so the way that we've built it is to make it flexible enough that you can zoom in and zoom out and sort of focus on the right kinds of VOP tests or the areas that you're interested in, versus just being a single you know one pane and that's all you get right and you don't know what you're looking for as you said either you have to educate people or they they feel like it's too basic and it's not really useful enough, uh, but absolutely it is. Yes, it is. I think I think that, that will be very welcome by by the company man because uh, one of the things that they don't like to do is to sit down at the end of the day and write down what happened in the whole operation. That's exactly They're right. Trying to memorize what happened in the morning and uh, usually if you have an engineer on site, which happens in offshore operations, you you leave that task to the engineer and then the the, the company man checks it uh, whether he's a, he agrees on that. But in a land operation that we run in Argentina, usually we have only one company man, not even two day and night. We have only one running the 24 hours. So you never know when he's uh, taking a sleep or he's awake. Tired. So he, does, <laughs> he barely has the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, and he's not used to writing. He doesn't like writing. So it, it could be very useful. We can offer that at the end of the uh, output, before sending it uh, to the office, to have a check and say, okay, yeah, exactly. this is a, a good wording or a good uh, representation of what we did or what happened. Well, what I see is not only a secretary, uh, the more important thing is that, I don't know, maybe she can uh, uh, do a, a light on this, um, is the system can suggest some action based on the performance also. Absolutely. So, um, so that's something we um, we have actually done in other some of the other industries. So, for example, I'll give you a slightly different example. It's something that we call prescriptive maintenance, which is really about having looked at sort of some of these uh, past types of incidents and events that have occurred. And obviously, in the past, because hindsight is twenty twenty, you know that you can go in the future and see what actually worked, what did not work. Um, we can use all of that information to then have NLP, deep, and we've actually deployed the system in aircrafts, so we've deployed the system in uh, automobile space, in the supply chain side around sort of maintenance of these turbines, maintenance of different aspects of the uh, different sort of parts of these systems, where when the technician is going in, they may or may not have the full uh, visibility and, and certainly will not have the time to go look at all the things that happen. So you're relying only on that person's knowledge. But now this is giving you the recommendation saying, hey, because you entered this this particular problem, here are the three things that fixed uh, this the last time. Here are similar events that occurred the last time. You know, you can then pick which one you think is the closest to the current one, and then you essentially applying those things. So we have actually taken, uh, used Deep NLP to where we've, uh, applied it to large numbers of geological reports. We've applied it to manuals, equipment manuals, uh, event logs, and using all of these things, now you have a more intelligent system that can recommend these. So you're absolutely right. It's not intended to just be a, a note taker type system. It is supposed to be uh, you know, an intelligent system that is providing uh, the right kinds of recommendations and help for the, uh, for the drillers, basically. Okay, Sheila, there is a, a new question from Ivan, which I find completely interesting. And uh, he says on the same line because he asked the previous one on the on the WitchML, is video feed uh, uh, from the rig close to our reality when it comes to a rig state or operational ID? 
So we haven't actually uh, processed video feeds yet, uh, but it could be. Um, so I haven't, we haven't actually, uh, we, again, we've done video feed analysis in other areas, but we haven't done that in the rig state analysis. I don't know, for example, David, maybe if you have uh, seen those and kind of how, how representative they are of reality. Um, we use them actually for other things. We're using video um, as a form of sensing. And so for movement of latches um, on a fingerboard for, uh, we're also looking at for, uh, when people are working around heavy machinery where you can actually slow the machinery down so you're tying uh, the, the, the readout of a human being being near something that's dangerous, you could actually stop the machine. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's kind of the work we've been doing on video. I have seen it. I, um, I won't say who. There was a driller working in Russia who used video constantly as a method of just reviewing constantly. Um, I don't know if that's going to come, but I know from a safety standpoint, we're, we're pulling it in more more video, particularly if we talk about removing cabins. That's 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 using a lot of that technology. But the, it's really advancing fast, the ability to use video um, on rigs, even for inspections. Uh, overhead inspection. There's a lot of things start to come in with drones, and uh, so we'll see more and more of video in everything that we do. The headsets work that way too for us, as it's using video to live connect um, support, but not not particularly for looking at operational behavior. Yeah. So on the drone side, we've certainly seen some of those use cases as well because we've applied some of these uh, some of these core models. And we've been able to deploy it on a drone, so you can actually process it on the edge because you know that way you can do inspections and things like that. But you're right; I, I haven't seen specific sort of rig, a rig state operations. That one we haven't come across at least. But certainly, as you said, David, many many different other video analysis that we have definitely done. It might be coming soon, I think. Well, uh, gentlemen, I think uh, this is time to to close up the the. the the meeting and uh, uh, first of all, thank you very much for your cooperation, your assistance, uh, uh, you, and uh, for the audience, to, for the attendance. Uh, I think uh, this kind of uh, meetings is, uh, are very interesting nowadays that we are all uh, facing the, the, how to operate, uh, how to run our operations while we are not able to have constant contact with the, the people that is actually uh, co-working with us in the, in the project. Uh, as a matter of fact, as an example for myself, I just drilled two wells in, uh, in Rio Negro and without going out from my house in Spain So uh, as a manager. So all these uh, things that uh, I can uh, give a, a, a both ways information, let's say, uh, commandments and uh, uh, feedback from the field uh, are very helpful. And more and more we are finding that uh, we might not be that physically close to the operation uh, to to run and to learn and to, uh, we, we always say the well is talking. Well, the well might be talking by telephone. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, <laughs> So, uh, so we can uh, actually listen from a distance. So thank you very much for your participation. Uh, muchas gracias al resto de la audiencia. La Comisión de Perforación eh, va a organizar más charlas como esta. Estamos atrás de alguna que espero que la hagamos antes de fin de año. Y eh, también en asuntos de altas tecnologías, no automatización particularmente, pero sí de altas tecnologías. Y eh, vuelvo a pasar el aviso de que en noviembre del año que viene tendremos el Congreso de Perforación en conjunto con la AOG, que va a ser esta vez en noviembre, no, no como nos tienen acostumbrados en septiembre. Parece que la agenda de la rural estaba muy apretada el año que viene por todos los eventos que desde este año se fueron eh, posponiendo al otro, ¿no? por el tema del COVID. Bueno, muchas gracias a todos. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.